right, um, I'm Sporus. Uh, this is my second time ever giving a talk at a conference, so I'm a little nervous right now. Um, anyways, yep, first time was with church. Um, I'm going to be talking about lock picking. Uh, I'm a member, well, I'll, first off, um, if you leave my talk, your chance of a Velociraptor related incident increases by 37%. Um, so don't leave, because um, I will hunt you down. Uh, so who am I? I'm a Fools member. Um, it's the Fraternal Order of Locksport. Uh, it's based out of Bloomington. Um, and I'm a criminal justice student at the University of Mississippi. And I'm an amateur strongman competitor. Uh, and I'm very nervous right now. And I have no idea what's in my slides, because um, my original slides have disappeared. Don't know what happened. And I remade them very quickly this morning. So. Um, so, Fools, we're a lockpicking club. It's mostly in the Bloomington area. Um, I'm, as I said, in Mississippi. Uh, we run villages at several different conferences. Our, our main village is at DerbyCon each year. Um, so if anybody ever made it out to DerbyCon, you probably saw us there. Uh, we run several competitions at the villages. We do a lot of research into uh, high security locks and new techniques. And we pretty much just have a lot of fun. And that's it. Um, so, Locksport. Wikipedia has a pretty good page on Locksport. Uh, it's a little out of date. Um, according to them, Locksport refers to the sport or recreation of studying and learning to defeat locking systems. Um, essentially, it's a term that was created so that we could differentiate what we do from locksmiths. Because we're not doing this for profit. We're not doing this you know, to get you into your house when you got locked out. We're doing this because a lock's like a puzzle. We want to learn how to open it. We want to learn how to defeat, you know, what wasn't supposed to be defeated. Um, in the picture there, it's uh, the Rumble Challenge from when we did it at the Level 1 hackerspace in Louisville during DerbyCon. Um, it's one of our main competitions we do. There's six stations, and each one has a common deadbolt lock on it. And as you're going, it, there's a motor on the back that will randomly cause everything to rumble. And when people start getting drunk towards the end of the competition, it starts to freak them out. Um, messes you up, but every time somebody picks a lock, a shot's dispensed, and so you know, depending on how you look at it, by the end of the game, either everybody won or everybody lost. Um, so, legal issues with lock picking. Uh, first off, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm not going to pretend to be, and I don't play one on TV. In most states, lock picking is perfectly legal. Um, you can see that by the green states on the map. I got this map from Tool US's website. They had some lawyers look into each state and determine how things were. So the green states, it's uh, perfectly legal. There's statutes saying that you're allowed to possess lockpick equipment without any problem. The bluish green colored states, um, in those, it's legal because they didn't say anything about it being illegal. Um, and then you get the yellow states where if you possess lockpicks, possession is actually evidence that you have intent to commit a crime. So as you can see, the state I'm from, Mississippi, by possessing lockpicks, they can say that I have intent to commit crimes. Um, you can get around that in most of the states by being a locksmith or showing that your job requires you to use the tools in some way. Um, and so. Right, the bluish green ones are the ones where their laws don't say anything about what, uh, whether lockpicking is legal or not, so it's assumed legal. Um, and then you have Tennessee. Tennessee has a, a completely different thing where they had laws set up because there's a very strong locksmiths union here in Tennessee, and their laws were set to protect against people coming and um, just drilling out your locks, knowing nothing about locksmithing, and essentially scamming you. Um, but the laws were created overly broad and essentially made it where it's very, very controlled here in Tennessee. Um, there's a couple exceptions to it if you're, if you're not a locksmith, where if you're a distributor or um, you know, security researcher, property owner, things like that, you can get around it. Um, so rules. Don't pick anything that's not yours unless you have explicit permission to. You know, that's, that's a given. Uh, don't pick anything that's in use because you have the potential of things getting destroyed, even if you don't use a broad X. Um, and, you know, don't do anything illegal. It takes a lot of the fun out of it, but, you know, I have to say these things. So how lock works. This slide's going to take forever to start up because my computer's going slow. Um, you have two sets of pins in each pin chamber. 
Your lower pins are your key pins, and your higher pins are called the driver pins. When you put the key in, it lifts the pins to the correct position so that between the plug and the housing, there's nothing keeping it from rotating. And you can see here that the key lines them up perfectly. Um, and so when you're picking, you're essentially trying to emulate the key, and you'll be maintaining tension on the plug the whole time. So what makes picking possible is th Um, so what makes picking possible? When they manufacture the locks, uh, you know, when you manufacture anything, you have tolerances, and most of the manufacturers have very loose tolerances. And so instead of the pin stacks being in a perfectly straight line, you end up with what you see here where they're, you know, sort of an S, or one will be off by a good bit, or, you know, different things like that. Um, because of that, when you apply tension, one of the pins will bind before the others, letting you pick that one into place and then move on to the next one that binds and so on. And uh, later on I've got a, a image showing how that's done. And so the tools that you'll use, um, starting from the my left, um, the tension wrench is probably your most important tool. You're going to use it every time you're picking a lock. Um, it's also called a tensioner, a torsion wrench if you want to be more correct, torsioner. Uh, lots of different things. Most people just call it a tension wrench because it's easy and everybody calls it that, even though it's a little incorrect. Um, you'll see different styles of it, but essentially you're using it to apply turning pressure on the plug while you're picking the lock. The Bogota, what we, this is a picture of the set that we sell at the conferences we go to. Um, this one's not a true Bogota uh, that you see created by Raimundo. Um, you can find online. It's got the same end on it, but the a real Bogota also works as a tensioner as well as working as a pick. The handle's a little different. Um, next you have the ball pick, uh, useful for wafer locks and a couple other things. I actually end up using mine as a, uh, you know, anytime I need something I don't have a tool for and I, I shape it. Um, then you have your snake, that's a raking tool. Half diamond, another raking tool, probably one of the most versatile tools. And then your short hook um, that you'll use for single pin picking. Um, and I'll get into these techniques in a little while. So first off, single pin picking. You'll put your tensioner in the plug and apply turning force, and then you'll put the pick in and you'll test each pin stack, attempting to find which one's binding. And so, as you see here, you found out that that one was binding. So you pick it up into position. Sometimes you'll feel it click as it gets there. Um, depending on how the lock is, it may or may not be very pronounced. And then you just move on to the next pin stacks. And keep testing them until you find the next one binding and so on. And eventually you'll have all of them and the lock will open for you, which should happen here in just a second. Um, and so that's picking. It's very simple. Um, it's something after you've done it once, you, you get a feel for it and it gets a lot easier. Your first couple times are, uh, you know, so you, you're clumsy, everybody's overhand, over, uh, overly forceful with it. Most people try and use a lot more turning pressure than is necessary. You really want a light touch because then you'll be able to feel what's actually going on inside the lock. Um, raking. Apparently I didn't put a picture in for this one. <laughs> so, um, so we'll go back to the last one. Uh, so raking is a technique that it, it will allow you to open the lock very quickly. Um, you'll end up trying to set multiple pin stacks at once. Uh, you'll take a tool like the half diamond or the snake rake that I've already shown or the Bogota or many other tools um, and you'll, it's also called scrubbing. You'll move it in and out of the, the lock very quickly um, applying a gentle upward pressure with each, each insertion trying to get all of the pins to rise up to the correct position and open the lock. Um, you'll see people most of the time start with that when they're trying to open something very quickly it can be very, very effective. I've got uh, several locks that I can open just by putting the, um, the pick in. And so there's a couple things lock manufacturers do to try and make things, you know, I say more interesting, but uh, to try and foil picking. Um, the main way they do this is by putting in security pins. I've got three examples of security pins pictured here. Uh, a mushroom pin, a spool pin, and a serrated pin. Each of those pins, essentially what they do is they cause what you see in the second picture here, where when you rise it up a little too far, um, it'll end up setting to where you feel like you set the pin to the correct position, 
but you've actually caused a false set. And getting past that, there's some techniques. Um, a lot of times when you're raking, you'll end up just blowing right past them without noticing it. Single pin picking, you'll have to let off on your tension, keep pushing forward until you set the pin one more time. Um, other things you'll see that I, again, don't have pictures for, uh, difficult keyways. Um, if you look at the front of any of your locks, you'll see that there's different designs for uh, what can fit into the lock. They can make those in a way that it's very hard to put any tools to the correct key in and makes it pick. Other things you'll see are an angled pin stack where when you put the key in, um, instead of the pins being straight up to the top, they get pushed over to the side, which makes it, again, harder to pick because you don't have that just straight upward motion that you can do. Um, and then there's also uh, things that can be done with adding multiple things that need that uh, need to be picked, whereas Medico is probably a prime example of that. In addition to lifting the pins into the correct position, you also have to turn them to the right position. And that sets a sidebar that will allow you to open the lock. Um, and you also run into different kinds of locks. You have disc detainers, wafer locks, all sorts of different things. And they all have to be picked a little differently. Um, and it, it's really interesting when you start looking into the different ways that manufacturers try and make it more difficult. But your most common that you'll run into are security pins. You'll even see them in cheap Chinese knockoffs and, um, and you know, some of your master locks, things like that. Uh, sometimes they make it very difficult, other times they don't. The best way that they can make the lock harder to pick is to have tighter tolerances. Um, other techniques for lock bypass, there's bumping. Um, who here is familiar with bumping? Pretty good uh, group of you. Um, so bumping, what you'll do is you'll cut a key to the lowest pin position. If you look at your, at your keys and from the diagrams earlier where we showed what was going on in the lock, you notice that there's different heights that each, um, each cut's set to. There's a set height that all the manufacturers use so that everybody can copy a key and make things to code. Um, when you make a bump key, you'll cut it to the lowest position, and sometimes you'll cut it just a little bit lower than that. And what you'll do is you'll put the key way under the lock, pull it out one pin stack's depth, and apply a little bit of pressure on it, and tap it with a bump hammer or a screwdriver or something like that. And what, you'll hap what will happen is you'll hit all of the pin stacks at once, and the, uh, the inertia from that will travel through the key pins into the driver pins and cause them all to fly upward and hopefully catch at the shear line at the same time, and the lock will open. When the first time you see it, it's kind of a mind-blowing thing, just how easy it is to open that lock. Um, other things you can do are impressioning. You take a blank key, put it into the lock, apply, uh, apply a lot of pressure, turning it and lifting it up and down. And then when you pull it out, there will be marks where each of the pin stacks were. You'll file those down one depth, do it again, and keep doing it until you end up with a copy of the key. And I'm getting a text message. Put that on silent. Um, and so that's a really effective way. There's competitions for that at several different conferences. Um, you'll see people that can copy a key by impressioning it, filing it down in under 30 seconds, which is really impressive to see. Um, shimming is an attack that you'll see a lot of times on padlocks. It's very effective on the cheap master uh, combination locks. Um, you'll take a small piece of metal, insert it between the shackle and the body of the lock, and it'll make it so that there's nothing there keeping the lock closed. It'll pop right open. Um, works on handcuffs, padlocks, all sorts of different things like that. Um, then you also see key attacks. I saw one of these two weekends ago that really blew my mind. Um, it was a, a lock from a manufacturer called Lips. They got bought out, and their manufacturing process was moved to another country. During that time, they, um, they had some problems where things were, the, their tolerances got messed up, things were made to incorrect sizings. And so one thing you can do with this lock, you can put a blank key into it and apply tension. And while you're applying tension, you pull the key out. As soon as the key comes completely out, you let off the tension just a little bit, and that causes all the key pins to fall back down into the plug. The lock opens right up. And what caused that to happen was only a 0.2 millimeter difference in the sizing of the pins to the holes that they were in. They, they remanufactured the pins to the 0.2 millimeters larger so that they actually fit into the holes and they, that attack doesn't work anymore. Um, 
and and that's one that actually works a lot better on things that have tighter tolerances because the uh, you won't end up with one pin stack binding way before all the others. Um, there's different key attacks like that that you can do. There's other bypass methods. Um, American Lock had a bypass method for a while that's now been fixed where you could put a tool in reaching back behind all of the pins and actually operate the cam at the back of the lock and just open it up completely bypassing the, uh, the pins. And that, that, ha that happens quite a bit as well. Um, and when things like that happen, you can use a screwdriver. Um, a lot of the wafer locks that you run into in desk drawers, there's a wafer in the very back of it that's a retainer. If you push that one up out of place, the entire thing pops out, and then you can use a screwdriver, turn it, open it up. Um, it, you know, a lot, of, a lot of different fun techniques you can use for all sorts of different kinds of locks. Um, somewhere you can get more information. Uh, our website, bloomingtonfools.org, we don't really have much up there. Um, it's mostly just where we announce when we do meetings. A lot of the images that I got from this were from Deviant Alum. He's one of the leaders of Tool US, and there's a link to his website. Um, it's a real nice thing that he does putting all his stuff online, makes it easier for all of us to give presentations like this. Uh, Lockpicking101.com is probably one of the biggest lockpicking forums on the internet. Um, all sorts of information there. For higher security stuff, uh, you have to be there for a while, establish yourself, and get permission to view those topics. Um, but for all your basic needs, it's, it's a great resource. And then Tool US's website, where I got the information about the uh, laws and the MIT Guide to Lockpicking, which came out in 1991 and it's still relevant today, um, which is kind of a testament to how lock technology really hasn't changed much. Um, one picture that I meant to include and forgot about was a picture of the lockpicks that were used in the Watergate scandal when they broke into the hotel room. Those lockpicks look exactly like the set that I showed you earlier that we saw at conferences. The you know, locks just really haven't changed much since the uh, pen tumbler uh, lock was invented in the early 1900s. So, um, let's see. I've gone way ahead of time. Um, but any questions? Why don't they fix locks? So, so w why don't they fix locks? You probably mean like uh, tolerances, things like that. Right. So, right. Well, um. You, you see different mechanisms a lot. They're increasingly um, common. Uh, the, the thing is that they're really cheap to make, and you really don't see picking used by criminals. Um, it, it's very, very rare when it happens. Uh, it's not cost effective for them to move to something else. And it's, uh, biometrics are becoming more popular. I don't really have any numbers on it. I haven't really looked into that. Um, uh, I've only gotten into lock picking in the past few years. and So I, I haven't looked into biometric bypass and things like that. Um, I do pen tumblers, disc detainers, wafers, things like that. Um, just your, your, the physical locks themselves. So. Right, right. That's that's the other thing. A criminal's yeah, a, a criminal's going to take the easiest way in. But the, I mean, it they, it is starting to change where they do make things better. They're improving things. The lock the, the lock industry for the past pretty much forever has always relied on security through obscurity, and that's part of what Locksport is uh, attempting to do is to fix that and you know show what's going on here and how they can fix it. Um, that's what happened with bump keys. Locksmiths had known about bump keys forever, um, and it was only within the past 15, 20 years or so that the general public found out about it. Around 2005, there were a bunch of headlines about it, making it sound like it was this brand new attack. Um, the locksmiths knew about it, they just kept other people from learning about it. And so Locksport's attempting to make these things more known so that they will end up getting fixed. But again, you're going to end up with people cutting your padlocks, breaking windows, kicking the door in, things like that, more often than they're going to go for these other methods. Uh, have you seen the, uh, the master lock that has like, the directional pad on it? I have. Have you seen any attacks on that? Um, so the, the master lock in question, it's uh, one where the combination is done by moving the, um, there's a knob on the front, you'll move it up, down, left, or right, and you'll do a certain combination with that. Um, 
the only attack that I've seen on it, because it's actually a very well-made lock um, for the, the price, um, there's a decoding attack on it. Uh, uh, once, you've, once you've got it down, it's pretty fast. Um, there's a lot of math that was involved in figuring out what would be done there. Um, and I, I can't explain it too well, because I just heard about it last week, actually. So the, that was good timing on this question. Yeah, there, there's a decoding attack, and once you get it down, it can actually be decoded in about 20 minutes without fail. So, um, you know, well, it, it, it's one of those things where that, that attack hasn't been publicly announced yet. Um, I, I just was talking with some people the other day and heard about it, and uh, they explained it. It's, you know, it's one of those that we're, we're working with them on it. So, I think there was a question in the back. Okay. It, yeah, the the TSA locks now. Um, so you know, we we've all encountered the TSA at some point or another since 2001. Um, they require you now when you lock your luggage to have a lock that is accessible by the TSA. Um, even your combination of locks, you'll notice that there's a keyhole on the bottom of it. They'll have a key ring of 15, 20 keys that will let them open any of the TSA approved locks. Um, the funny thing is that a lot of times they won't even bother with that though, and they'll go ahead and cut off your TSA approved locks. Right, right, yeah. All, all the TSA locks are made very cheaply. Um, there's, there's really nothing good about them. It's, it's one of those. It, it, it doesn't even work very well as uh, showing you that somebody didn't get into your luggage because they're so easy to open. But, it, you know, I, I suppose it's better than nothing. You know, how, how much are you going to trust the people that you checked your baggage with? That's what you have to decide on. It's it's mostly it's it's aimed towards the scamming thing, but you know you can depending on how you want to look about it, it look at it. It could be about the licensing. Um, other states don't require the licensing that Tennessee does. Uh, like in Mississippi, for example, you just have to set up a business and say you're a locksmith, and you don't have to have any training or anything like that. Um, Tennessee, you actually have to be a licensed locksmith. You have to be a member of the American Locksmiths organization of them. A A L O A L O A. I don't remember what all it stands for. I was going to say America twice, but that, that would have been incorrect. Um, yeah, it's, it, you know, that's one of those, y you just kind of have to decide how you're going to look at it as to whether it's all about scammers, whether it's about protecting the locksmiths themselves. Um, I try to be a little optimistic, but it's, it's hard. And so it, it probably is just about protecting them. So, um, Yes. So a two-sided key, you're, um, you're you're probably thinking of like a for a car, an automobile. Um, most of the time, that's actually not a pin tumbler lock. That's a wafer lock. Um, it, it it operates on the same principles, but um, instead of having the pins, you'll have oblong wafers in there that have to be put into the correct position. And uh, if you notice, the sides are the same most of the time, so it doesn't matter how you put it in. Um, and all you're doing is lifting wafers on either side of the lock into position. Uh, most, of the, most of the time with automobiles nowadays, you'll either have a transponder in it that makes it so that you can't open it unless the key has the transponder, or they'll have sidebars and other things that make it a little bit more complex to open, but you're, you'll find basic wafer locks um, that are still double-sided uh, that can easily be raked open um, with a ball pick or something like that. Can so, you rake both sides or is it just uh, it, on it depends on your, on your tool. Some tools like a ball pick are real good for raking both sides. Other tools, uh, if you're using like a half diamond, you'll have to rake one side and then rake the other. Right. Um, you know, it, it really just varies with your tools. The most important tools you're going to get are, are tensioners. Um, like if you look at, at my set that I don't have down here with me right now, I have just the basic tools that were shown there, and then I have about 30 more tensioners. Because um, you'll find as you get into it more that having a tensioner that fits that lock perfectly makes things a lot more easier, a lot more easy than having more diamonds, more hooks, things like that. Um, and especially with those double-sided locks, they make tensioners that will be out of the way so that you can rake both sides very easily. So. Yeah. 
So, so um, talking about uh, like tubular keys, um, see, see them a lot, or used to see them a lot on vending machines, um, and, thing, and cash boxes, things like that. Um, it's essentially the same mechanism as a pen tumbler. You still have pen stacks; they're just arranged in that circular motion. If you look at the key, there's cuts to different depths around it. Um, it's harder to pick because it's harder to get tension on it. But if you have a tool that's specifically made for a tubular lock, then it can be picked very easily. And those tools actually, once you've picked it, uh, the tool actually works as a copy of the key. And then afterwards, you just put the tool on there, open the lock back up. Um, with the better made ones by brands like Ace, things like that, um, you'll, you'll need a tool like that to pick it. The real cheap ones that you see a lot on uh, like bike locks, um, you can pick them with a big pin. Um, you're essentially impress impressioning the lock. Uh, you can pick them with, um, if you roll up a sticker that's the diameter of the tube, you can pick it with that. I uh, actually did that a couple weeks ago for the first time, and it was another one of those, like, wow, that was really easy. But, but yeah, they, they really don't provide much more security. So. Um, and, but they'll do the same thing with them where they'll have spool pins that try and make things more difficult. So um, a lot of times with those, uh, you'll have you know the different uh, zigzags cut into the sides of them, things like that. What it's doing is it's moving stacks um, where instead of lifting them with the top of the key, there will be a piece that sticks out into the side. And so it'll slide through that, and it has to align in the right way so that it'll drop a sidebar into place and open it. Um, there, most of them are pickable, um, but it's one of those where you you have to spend some time with it. There's some specialized tools made for them, but they, they do greatly increase security because most of the time there are also very tight tolerances on them. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, just going and getting cheap master locks, um, you know, the basic master lock, the silver with the blue band around the bottom or the brass colored with the blue band, those are uh, really good ones to start with. Typically have four pins, typically won't have any security pins. Um, and they'll vary from, I've got some that you can just put the pick in and it'll open up. Uh, and then I've got others where you'll have to single pin pick them and it'll take a little while. It, it's kind of luck of the draw with those. And they're a great start. And then moving on to different master locks and then starting with deadbolts, things like that. Yeah, the, um, the this practice locks like that are a good thing. When we do our villages, we have sequentially pinned locks like that where you can just do one pin and then you'll add one more pin each time. So that, that way when you're learning single pin picking, you can get the feel for that one, open it up, and, and move on. It's a great way to learn it. Um, and then those those where you can see the pin stacks, see what's going on are good as well. The problem with those is that you can start getting reliant on your vision for when it's in the right position. Um, and so I, I like to tell people to stick with a lock where you can't actually see what's going on because then you'll actually get a good feel for it. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a little different when you start getting into high security things like medicos and stuff like that because when you start having multiple things that you have to do before it's picked open, it's good to have that visual aid to start with so you fully understand what's going on. And, and that's, that's where those come into play. Is if you don't fully understand the lock, it's a, it's a good tool. If you understand what's going on, it's better to just go ahead and get a feel for it with a lock that you can't see what's in there. But the sequ sequentially pinned ones are, are a great tool for learning single pin picking. So any other questions or anything? Comments? Um, I don't have any set goals like that. Uh, a lot of times, I, I, I tried timing myself on some locks, and it, there really just didn't seem to be any point for it. Um, it for me, the goal is just getting it, um, especially when I get to higher security locks. You know, it's one of those, especially if I don't know what's going on in it, can I figure out what's going on, or 
can I learn a lock so that I can open it a little bit quicker the next time? But I don't, I don't ever set any set goals like that. There's competitions where time really does come into, into play, um, where it could be a little different. But I don't, I don't typically compete. I just do it for fun. So. Uh, things like the Medico, where you have to turn the pins at the same time um, as as lifting them, and uh, then you get into disc detainers, where you have to actually, instead of lifting pins, you turn discs to certain angles so that a sidebar can drop in and allow it to spin, and things like that. So. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, then I think we'll let everybody go.